This is Back Off, Witch, A Croft and Tabby Short, Book Two, by Brad Magnarella, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Chapter One uh, Tabitha grunted. Huh? I peered up from the student paper I was grading and found my plus-sized cat shifting restlessly on the divan. Adjusting myself in my reading chair, I sighed and dropped my gaze back to the beginning of the paper. A minute later, Tabitha let out a disconsolate, I clenched my jaw. She knew exactly what she was doing, but I refused to take the bait. I backed up a sentence, lost the thread of the student's very fuzzy argument, and had to start all over again. I slapped my pencil down onto the paper. What? You know what? She snapped. It's as hot as the devil's crotch in here. It's 82 degrees. Warm, granted, but if you stopped moving around so much, you'd be fine. I gestured to the ice bags I'd piled around her cushion like the lower tiers of an igloo and the three fans pointing directly at her. Ginger tufts of her hair spun ahead of the currents buffeting my apartment, one already having ended up in my mouth. Why can't you just buy a window unit? She complained. Because this is temporary. We're supposed to dip again next week. We'd had the opposite problem back in October when, surprised by an early cold front, the building had taken several days to change over to its heating system. It wouldn't switch back to AC again until May, meaning we had to manage the November heat wave on our own. This year's happened to coincide with my fall break, when I'd been planning to catch up on an unwieldy pile of ungraded papers. Planning being the operative term, Tabitha's complaints had been going on for two days now. Of all the wizards to imprison me in this wretched body, she continued, it had to be a miserable cheapskate. If I'm so cheap, I should probably return your case of premium goat's milk then, huh? Not to mention your tuna steaks, your filet mignons. Threatening her food supply usually quieted her down, but she was in one of her rare moods. I've seduced princes in my lifetime, titans of industry. I've lived in palaces and on grand estates, eaten dinners worth their weight in gold, worn dresses that women literally killed for. And now look at me, having to contemplate licking myself all over to keep from heat-stroking. I'll be happy to drop you in a bucket of ice water. But with my recent luck, she continued, I'll choke on a fur ball and die. Be sure to write out your last will and testament. Not that you own anything. Of course you wouldn't care, she went on contemptuously, perfectly content to sweat in your underclothes like a common pig. Do pigs wear underclothes? As she narrowed her ochre green eyes at me, I could see her preparing her next assault, but I was spared by a knock at the door. Silence mode, I reminded her as I went to answer it. Beyond the peephole stood a petite young woman with a snow-white pixie cut and large glasses. She waved. Hi, Everson. Kayla? I asked, unbolting the door. At the last moment, I pulled on my trench coat, which was hanging on the doorside rack. Tabitha exaggerated a lot of things, but not about being in boxers. Just as I was fastening the coat's belt, the door opened and Kayla clomped past me wearing a pink summer dress and a pair of polished black combat boots. Do you have anything cold to drink? She asked without preamble. You can see what's in the fridge. I followed her into the kitchen. We're out of ice, though. Her again, Tabitha said blandly. Fortunately, Kayla had already opened the refrigerator door and the top half of her body was inside. How's your dad doing? I asked loudly. I hadn't seen Kayla Starling since helping her father out with a supernatural creature that had terrorized his construction site. He'd ended up in the hospital, which was better than dead, but I still felt guilty. How's he doing? She repeated as she emerged with a carton of orange juice. Stubborn, crabby, aggravating, his usual self. He returned to work against doctor's orders, but it's probably the best medicine for him. Don't tell him I said that. Thanks again for what you did. I'm just glad he's all right. 
And how have you been? Going for a new look? The last time I'd seen her, she was sporting brunette hair down to her waist. Oh, a friend of mine did this last week. The inspiration came to me during a lucid dream where I was in a mystical highland at night. The reflection of a full moon beckoned from a nearby pond, whispering that whatever I saw in the water would be of vital importance in the next lunar cycle. I expected to find a runestone or some kind of animal totem. I've been feeling really connected to amphibians lately. She paused to swig straight from the carton. But what I saw was a reflection of myself, and I had this short, moon-like hair, the message being to honor my wisdom. Tabitha snorted. Your wisdom? How interesting, I said over my cat's remark. Kayla was steeped in emotional auras, intuitive readings, and energy healings, despite having little to no actual abilities in any of them. Her sincerity, however, was very genuine, which made her hard not to like. And that's the reason I'm here, she finished. I squinted at her. To show me your lucid dream hair? No, to honor my wisdom. I believe I have another supernatural case for you, but it's best if I take you to this one. As she replaced the orange juice in the fridge, I looked over at the stack of student papers fluttering beside my reading chair. Beyond them, Tabitha was fussing on the divan again. <sighs> okay, I said. A sudden smile lit up Kayla's eyes. Is that a yes? Right now, anything that gets me out of here is a yes. Chapter 2 Following a change of clothes and a 30-minute subway ride, during which Kayla talked incessantly about carnelian crystals, we emerged from the station at Brooklyn's Park Slope neighborhood. It had fared better than the rest of the borough in the wake of the crash, but it still carried an edge. Several businesses were shuttered, and clusters of hardened teens watched us from the streets. Unconcerned, Kayla waved or smiled at everyone until we arrived at a block of brownstones with street-level businesses. Here it is, she said, stopping in front of one. I read the sign aloud. The Superhero Depot? I volunteer here. Come on, let me show you the inside. Volunteer? I waited for an explanation, but she was already pulling the door open. The inside was blessedly air-conditioned and exactly what the name suggested. The store sold everything from masks and costumes to tactical belts and spell kits to powdered supplements for special abilities. Out of curiosity, I picked up a container promising super strength. The ingredients, in very fine print, were for chocolate milk. The place seemed popular with the neighborhood kids, anyway. There were already a couple of them inside when we arrived, and now three more ran toward the back. Hey, Kayla! They shouted in passing. Apparently, she really did volunteer here, but I couldn't begin to see how this related to a case. I didn't think you were coming in today, someone said. I replaced the container on its shelf and turned to find a middle-aged man dressed as Clark Kent. Beneath his dark, gelled hair and a pair of lensless glasses, his shirt was unbuttoned to reveal a blue spandex shirt with the famous S logo. I hoped to God he worked here and didn't just hang around for kicks. Clark, this is the friend I was telling you about, Kayla said, gesturing to me. I'm just giving him the tour. Clark Everson, Everson Clark. And yes, that's his actual name. Clark Lindsay, he manages the store. That's a relief, I murmured. Clark regarded me with a pair of critical blue eyes. It's a pleasure to meet you, Everson. As we shook hands, he asked, Have you done this before? Still not knowing why I was here, I looked to Kayla for assistance. Her quick nod urged me to say yes. A little here, a little there, I hedged. Today might not be the best day, actually, he told Kayla. We have a full house. At this point, I had no idea what anyone was talking about. The store was far from full, but I was picking up some weird tension between Kayla and Clark. Oh, but Everson can do magic, Kayla said. Clark's eyes glinted as they returned to mine. Is that right? Whether or not he was the client, I thought I'd made it clear to Kayla that my wizard identity was to stay between us. With blood rushing to my face, I stammered, well, not real magic or anything. Clark laughed. 
You're in the right place, then. All right, go ahead. I'm sure they'll enjoy that. They? I thought, peering around again. Thanks, Kayla said coolly. As he left us, she hooked her arm in mine and walked me toward the back. Sorry about that, she whispered. I thought he would be off today, and I don't want him to know why I brought you. So, not the client. While we're on the subject, why did you bring me? I was starting to suspect that soliciting my help had been an excuse to take me to her favorite store, where she volunteered for reasons that only made sense to her. I could feel my patience thinning, not least because I'd worn my trench coat and was sweating rivulets, even despite the AC. You'll see in a sec, she replied. Step over here, please. We were at the back of the store, but the kids who'd flown past a moment ago were nowhere to be seen. Kayla solved the mystery by pulling a wall of shelving. It swung out to reveal a secret corridor and a clamor of kids' voices. Kayla watched me with clasped hands, clearly pleased by my reaction. It's an after-school tutoring center, she said. At the end of the corridor, we stepped into a sizable room that held bookshelves, study tables, and about 20 kids, including the vanished three. So this is where you volunteer. Every Tuesday and Friday. Isn't it cool? Very cool, I agreed, seeing now what Clark meant by a full house. In addition to the 20-odd kids, three college-aged adults were struggling to get everyone to settle down. Is this the magic guy? One of them asked, looking from her phone to me. Apparently, Clark had texted ahead. Before I could answer, Kayla waved her arms overhead. Listen up, my angels, she announced. If everyone sits down and gets really quiet, we have a special treat for you. My friend Everson Croft is a magician, and he's here to perform a couple of neat tricks. In a rush of excited whispers, the kids complied, which seemed magical in and of itself, but now forty sets of eyes were staring up at me expectantly. Kayla patted my back to wish me luck and stepped away. Hi, I raised my hand awkwardly. I'm, uh, Everson. Are you gonna make something disappear? One of the kids asked. Yes, I said, grateful for the suggestion. As a matter of fact, I am. Watch closely. I lifted my protective coin from around my neck by its chain and dropped it into my right hand. I showed it to everyone, passed my other hand over it, and then showed them that my right hand was now, miraculously, empty. Ta-da! My late grandfather had taught me the trick, along with several other sleights of hand. A few appreciative oohs sounded, but the majority of the audience appeared unimpressed. Shoot, my sister can do that, a large boy with a fade cut said. And I can still see the necklace, a girl added. It's that lump in his sleeve. Voices went up as the other kids began to spot it, too. I quickly pocketed my hands and let the coin and chain slide out. It's in his pocket now, Fade Cut said. That's not nice, Troy, one of the volunteers told him. I glanced over at Kayla. She was smiling above her clapping hands, blithely unaware that the crowd was turning against me. You guys are good, I scowled. But have you ever seen someone levitate? Oh man, Troy complained. He's going to turn so you can only see one leg, then he's going to go up on his tiptoes with the other. My sister showed me that one, too. Damn it. I stopped turning. Can everyone see both of my legs? I asked as I squared myself back toward the audience. A few murmurs went up in response. Well, can you? Yes, they answered in unison. How about you, spoiler guy? I asked Troy. Yeah he said, still trying to affect a seen-it-all expression, but he straightened slightly with interest. All right, watch very closely. Feeling pressured to up my game, by a group of kids, no less, I decided that one teensy-weensy invocation wouldn't hurt. Protezione, I whispered. In a crackle of energy, the air under my feet hardened. I grew it upward so that, inch by teetering inch, it gave the impression that I was floating. By the time I was a half foot off the floor, my audience had lost its collective mind. They were all shouting at once, but while some pressed forward for a closer look, the rest were scrambling back in exhilarated fright. Troy was among the second group. I dropped down and pretended to stagger with exhaustion. 
Do it again, they cried. One more time, one more time. I'm afraid that took all my energy, I said. But if you work hard this afternoon, I'll attempt it again before I leave. When the kids saw I wasn't going to budge, they returned to their seats and started into their homework. A strange satisfaction moved through me as I looked over the room. I had never worked with kids before, and after the rocky start, I'd never planned on doing so again. But I actually enjoyed that. Kayla rushed up and patted my back. You're a natural. Well, it is in my blood, I said modestly. Who's he? I nodded at a young boy in the back, no more than seven or eight. He wore a green cape he must have picked up in the store. Throughout my act, he'd remained hunched over a piece of paper, working obsessively. He hadn't looked up once, not even when his peers went screaming and scrambling past him. Oliver Johnson, he's actually who I wanted you to see. I looked from the boy back to her. The case involves a child? She nodded solemnly, moisture already standing in her eyes. I think there's a monster in his closet. Chapter 3 A monster, I repeated. My knee-jerk skepticism went back to our first encounter a few years earlier when Kayla and her friends believed they were calling up a benign nature spirit and ended up with a giant acid-spewing slug, I'd lost my right earlobe banishing the thing, but because Kayla had been right about the strange doings at her father's construction site last month, I decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. How about talking me through why you think there's a monster in his closet? Oliver hasn't always been like this, she said. He started coming here last year for help with his reading. I wasn't volunteering then, but the others say he was sociable in a sweet and gentle way, always smiling and he loved the volunteers. Now he does this every day, comes in, goes straight to the back, draws by himself, and then leaves with his mother. He won't talk to anyone. As we watched him, Oliver hunched further over his project, lips compressed in a frown. There could be a medical reason, I suggested. He's being treated for slow-onset autism, but I don't buy it. I did a remote auric reading on him. Here we go, I thought. His etheric layer is fine. That's the one that mirrors the physical. But his emotional layer is distressing. It's too thin. And the colors are infused with a dull grayness, like he's aged 80 years. Not only that, the frequency feels really off to me. As she spoke, I tuned into my wizard's senses. As if the lights had been cut, the room dimmed and astral energies bloomed into view including the pulsating auras of the twenty kids. They were colorful and vibrant, all except for Oliver's. Thin wasn't a bad way to describe it. I mentally added scraped and worn. It is off, I agreed as the room returned to view. But going from his aura looks different to there's a monster in his closet is a pretty sizable leap. Is that something he told you? Not in so many words. My skepticism knee-jerked again. All right, let's hear it. That boy you were joking with earlier? Joking with? I looked around until I realized she meant fade cut. He was presently kicking the kid opposite him under the table. Oh, him. Troy has a wonderful life-affirming energy, but it can make him a little rowdy. Anyway, last week he asked to see what Oliver was drawing, when Oliver wouldn't show him, Troy took the drawing. Poor little Oliver let out the most piercing scream I'd ever heard. I think it even scared Troy. I quickly recovered the drawing, making a point of not looking at it. I wanted to honor Oliver's private creation, but when I handed it back to him, I happened to catch what looked like a creature coming out of a closet and a little boy in his bed. Tears returned to her eyes. I think the drawings are Oliver's way of coping with something he knows no one will believe. Though she hadn't made a particularly strong case, I nodded sympathetically. The boy was clearly dealing with something for him to have changed so suddenly, even if it wasn't supernatural. Did anything notable happen around the time he changed? I asked. That was when his mother took custody of him, according to Clark. 
She was really young when she gave birth to him, and she was having personal problems. She spent time in a rehab center. Oliver stayed with his grandparents until she'd fulfilled all the conditions of the court, which she did this summer. So he'd never lived with her before? I don't believe so, and she just moved into her own place. I made a mental note of that, but this was a tricky situation. I couldn't very well show up, tell his mother that we suspected something was haunting his bedroom, and start nosing around. For all I knew, his medical diagnosis explained everything, and he just liked to draw scenes from scary movies. When my silence stretched out, Kayla asked, Can you do anything? Not without knowing more. Are you sure he won't talk to anyone? We've all tried, she sighed. I even brought in a homemade puppet. He just gets agitated. And he won't show his pictures to anyone? I squinted at the folder beside his elbow, thick with what I assumed were his drawings. A pattern of orange cats adorned the folder's cover. The backpack, leaning against the legs of his chair, had a similar theme going. Is that Garfield? I asked. It's his favorite cartoon character. That's why he wears the cape. Something to do with a movie Garfield was in? I noticed the large G stitched on the back of the cape. The kid was a super fan. How much longer will Oliver be here? I asked, cogs turning in my head. A couple more hours. Why? What if I told you my cat could talk? I said it quietly and watched for her reaction, but she only nodded. Yeah, I know. What? I heard her this morning. And you didn't say anything? It sounded like she was in a bad mood. I barked a laugh. Not to her, to me. Weren't you floored, or at least curious? You're a wizard. And? Well, I just assumed talking cats were standard in your world. I could only smile and shake my head. Kayla never ceased to surprise me. She returned her attention to Oliver. I think I see where you're going with this, she said. Will your cat cooperate? Absolutely not, Tabitha said. Hey, last month I gave you a choice, I said. Either help me on cases like these or patrol the outside ledge. And since you haven't been outside, despite the expensive cat door I installed, that leaves helping me. Well, you didn't say anything about being a comfort animal for a child. You're not going to be his comfort animal, I said through gritted teeth. We just need you to coax him into showing you his drawings. Kayla had volunteered to come back to my apartment with me, but I knew Tabitha was going to be difficult enough without an audience. Coax, Tabitha repeated. Do I look like a coaxer to you? Maybe not, but she bore enough of a resemblance to Oliver's favorite cartoon character that her presence alone, and maybe a few sarcastic utterances, might do the trick. I didn't risk telling her that part, though. The room is air-conditioned, I said in a sing-song voice. Ice cold. Tabitha stopped fussing around on her divan long enough to stare at me with hooded lids. Sure, darling, for the twenty minutes I'll be there. But that bit of teasing will only heighten my suffering back home. Plus, I was just beginning to enjoy your absence, only for you to show back up, panting like a dog. I decided to play my ace. You know, Nick's seafood is on the way home. Before she could catch it with her tongue, a droplet of saliva spread across the hairs of her lower lip. Nick's seafood, you say? And I hear their swordfish is to die for. Chapter 4 Kayla was waiting when I returned through the secret passageway at the superhero depot, carrying Tabitha's pet carrier. You only have about ten minutes, she whispered. Tabitha was to thank for that. Despite finally agreeing to come, she made sure that the preparations to leave took twice as long as they needed to, forcing me to splurge on a cab. Only half the kids remained in the tutoring center now, but Oliver was among them, alone at his seat in back. Okay, okay, I said, moving the pet carrier to my other side to shield Tabitha from the room's view. We're going now. I was halfway to Oliver when Troy looked over. He was still here as well, unfortunately. 
Is that a cat? He asked loudly. It is, but she's asleep, so I tapped a finger to my lips. No, she's not. I can see her eyes. Man, that thing is fat. Inside the carrier, Tabitha spat out several four-letter words. Troy, one of the volunteers, said, Come back and finish your reading. I just want to take a look. He got up, arced his back to escape the volunteer's grasping hand, and hustled over. Can I feel how much she weighs? Before I could answer, he'd pried my fingers from the handle and commandeered the carrier. He hefted it up and down a few times, sending Tabitha from one end of the container to the other. Holy crap, he marveled. Put me down, you cretin, she hissed. By this time, the remaining kids had started crowding in, their commotion drowning her out. I warned them they were jeopardizing their chance to see another magic trick, but they were too engrossed in my overweight cat to care. Frustrated, I lunged to reclaim her carrier, but someone else beat me to it. Oliver. With a determined look, the small boy seized the container and swung it out of Troy's reach. When Troy moved in, Oliver hunkered over it protectively. A volunteer intercepted Troy and escorted him back to his chair, while the remaining volunteers dispersed the crowd. Oliver placed the carrier carefully on the seat beside him and returned to his work. I started over to join them, but Kayla's hands wrapped my arm. Let's see what happens, she whispered. Not a good idea. Tabitha's a succubus. She consumes souls. But if we go over there, he'll get agitated. Did you miss the consumes souls part? Through the mesh door, Tabitha's eyes narrowed at me in a murderous stare. Despite my warning, I couldn't quite allow myself to believe she'd hurt a child. I motioned for her to start coaxing. When she remained glaring at me, I mimed enjoying a delicious meal at Nick's seafood. She rolled her eyes and muttered something. Oliver stopped drawing and looked at her. Tabitha said something else. Kayla's grip on my arm tightened. Oliver glanced around, ensuring they were alone, then held his picture up to the door of her carrier. It's working, Kayla whispered excitedly. Oliver, what are you doing? A voice snapped. I turned to find a young woman in a jean jacket emerging from the passageway. The beaded ends of her cornrows clacked together as she paced authoritatively toward Oliver. Though she looked to be in her twenties, she wore the severe expression of someone much older. His mother, Kayla whispered to me. Janelle. Oliver straightened from Tabitha's carrier and hurriedly placed his drawing in his folder, which he slid into his backpack. His mother wasn't interested in the drawing. She peered into the carrier, then straightened and looked around, eyes sharp with challenge. Who placed a live cat beside my son? I raised a hand. Oh, ah, uh, she's mine, his mother squinted at me. I've never seen you here before, and you are? Everson, I just brought her for the kids to visit with, and Oliver really seemed to like her, so... I thought that would please her, but she crossed her arms and gave me a look that suggested she wanted to break my ribs. Well, Everson, did it ever occur to you that my son might be allergic to cats? No, actually. Is he? She ignored my question and took her son's hand. Let's go, Ollie. As she led him past us, a little aggressively, I thought, she stared at me. Ask, next time. I looked down at Oliver. Not only did he show no signs of an allergic response, but he was peering back at Tabitha's pet carrier longingly. Will do. I told her. Have a great day. Oliver's mother nodded at Kayla, who returned one of her beatific smiles. When they'd left, Kayla patted my arm. After everything she had to go through to get Oliver back, Janelle's a little protective of him. You think? I breathed. Let's see what he showed Tabitha. I caught her arm before she could rush over. A couple ground rules. First, don't come off as desperate. That will only stoke her urge to withhold info. And second, who was I kidding? Instructing someone on how to deal with Tabitha would require an entire manual. Why don't you just let me take lead? Kayla nodded as I sidled past her. So, I asked Tabitha casually, how did it go? We had a fascinating session of show and tell, but it's going to take a little fish oil to loosen this tongue. I believe a meal at Nick's seafood was promised me. Beyond the mesh door, Tabitha issued a biting smile. How much longer?
Kayla whispered. We'd been standing in my kitchen for the last half hour, peeking over our coffee mugs at Tabitha. After breaking my wallet at Nick's, she'd had the gall to tell us she needed time to digest before she could divulge anything. Now she was back to making a show of getting comfortable on the divan. Give her another couple minutes, I whispered back. One advantage of Tabitha's weight was that she usually tired of lording over information sooner rather than later. When she collapsed down with a disconsolate sigh, I nodded at Kayla that it was safe. We moseyed over and took a seat on the couch. Above her closed eyes, Tabitha's ears flattened in irritation. Can't I take a nap first? No, I said. A deal's a deal. When her eyes remained closed, I resorted to subtle threats. I'd be happy to prepare a tickle potion to wake you up, but those can take days to burn off. Or you can talk to us now and sleep for as long as you want. Your choice. She squinted an eye open at Kayla. Do you see the tortures he puts me through? Kayla wisely remained silent, returning a sympathetic smile. With a groan, Tabitha pushed herself up to her front paws and glowered at me. What do you want to know? Everything, I said, from the moment Oliver placed you beside him to when he left. I started off by telling him that if he ever handled my carrier like that again, I'd claw him a new face. You said that to Oliver? Kayla asked wordedly. Try stuffing yourself into a dryer and setting it to tumble. Maybe you'll understand what getting swung around in a carrier feels like. Kayla nodded. You're right. I'm sorry for challenging your truth. Tabitha regarded her suspiciously. When she understood Kayla wasn't being a smartass, like me, she said, Well, you needn't worry because he didn't hear me, but then he had the audacity to point from the cat on his folder to my face, as if I look anything like that pot-bellied waste of ink. The boy is talented, though. I'll allow him that. Not that he'll ever be mistaken for a Renaissance master. Speaking of which... Did I ever tell you about the time I nearly seduced El Greco? You're talking about Oliver's drawing, right? I cut in. What was it of? I don't know, she snapped at my redirection. A woman standing in his closet? Kayla and I were sitting close enough together that she clutched my arm. What did she look like? I asked. Tabitha shrugged and began licking her shoulder to further demonstrate her annoyance with me. Good looking? I asked, hoping to prod her competitive instincts. It worked. God, no. She was old and bent with awful hair falling all over her face. And the rags. I can't believe anyone with an ounce of self-respect would go out into the world looking like that. Prominent features? I pressed. Being hideous isn't prominent enough? Other than that, I said thinly. The horn in her forehead was a little off-center. A horn? I repeated. It didn't occur to you to lead with that? I'm a succubus once removed from a demon. Horns aren't exactly unusual in my part of town. It all made sense now. The changes that had come over Oliver, the wasted state of his aura, his obsessive drawing. Damn it, I muttered. He's being preyed on by a babaroga. What's that? Kayla asked. What does it mean? It means I need to get into his house. Tonight. Chapter 5 While I stood working on a stealth potion at my iron table, Kayla sat lotus style on the floor of my library slash lab, studying a thick tome of myths. A wicked creature of Slavic folklore, she read in a murmur. Hunched back, elderly, wields a sharp horn that grows from her forehead. She looked up. It is her. That's how the name translates, I said, stirring the steaming potion slowly. Baba means old woman, and Roga, horn. There are stories of her stalking villages at night in search of naughty children, Kayla said. She'd steal them from their beds, stuff them in a sack, and carry them to a cave to devour them. That's horrifying. That's sort of the point. Baba Roga started out as a story parents told their kids to scare them into behaving. When enough kids bought in, the collective belief manifested her. But this one doesn't appear to be feeding on Oliver physically. It's doing so psychically, 
which can be just as dangerous. How did this one end up in New York, though? Probably through an artifact. Eastern Europeans have been immigrating to the city for over 200 years. One must have brought something to which a Babaroga's energy had attached itself. The artifact remained dormant until it was in the proximity of a sleeping child. Oliver, in this case. Do you think there have been other children? Can't rule it out. I adjusted the heat lower on the portable burner. But the Babaroga seems to be taking her time in Oliver's case, and not because she's savoring the meal. I think it's because she's been dormant. If she'd had victims prior to Oliver, I'd expect her to be stronger. When did you say he moved in with his mom? This past summer. That was when the changes started. Yeah, that's a long time for a Babaroga attack. We may have lucked out. Still, the creature's entire reason for existing is to devour children, and judging from Oliver's aura, she doesn't have much longer to get there. Kayla set the book aside. What's the plan? This potion I'm brewing will get me into his building unseen. Once there, I pull a fire alarm, wait for Oliver and his mother to evacuate their unit, then slip inside. When I find the artifact, I'll pack it in salt and bring it back here to burn. If the stored energy is as weak as it's acting, it should disperse pretty easily. And that will restore Oliver? I nodded. Children's auras are blessedly resilient. Grateful tears shone beyond her glasses, and she smiled. I gave my potion a final stir and tapped the wooden spoon against the pot, smiling myself. I'd never used my magic to help a child before, and it felt good. Wholesome. Aren't you worried about the fire alarm, though? She asked. In what way? Well, what happens if the firefighters get there before you leave? Not likely. Did you see the article in the Gazette last week? The budget cuts to the fire department have been so severe that one of the engine companies had its truck repossessed for non-payment. I shouldn't laugh, but the point is they're barely operational these days. I'll be long gone before they respond. She pushed herself to her feet. What can I do? I felt my smile tighten. This was going to be a one-wizard operation, and I didn't want someone with delusions of innate magic getting in the way. I struggled for how to respond until I remembered our conversation on the ride to Brooklyn. You talked about carnelian crystals earlier and their power to amplify intentions. I felt guilty for dangling something that would do absolutely nothing, but Kayla was already nodding. The carnelian's particular design allows energy to pass in easily, but once there... It becomes trapped. The confined energy bounces from wall to wall, vibrating at higher and higher frequencies so that by the time it achieves the escape threshold, the intentions someone binds to it are that much more potent. I affected an expression of interest. I'll perform an actualization ceremony for a successful outcome, she decided. I'll time it to align with when you'll be in the building. Great. Speaking of the building, do you have an address for me? She retrieved a folded piece of paper from her hemp bag and handed it over. It's a government-subsidized apartment in Prospect Heights. I retrieved the address at the behest of my intuition. The student forms are in Clark's office, so I had to be a little crafty. He's weird about that stuff. Is something going on with you guys? She stared at me, unblinking. Why do you ask? I thought I picked up some tension between you earlier. We were in love once. You and Clark? What's so odd about that? N no, I stammered. It's just not something I would have pictured. I mean, not that I was picturing anything. You think I'm too freakish for him? Look, it's really none of my business. Well, it doesn't matter now. A shadow seemed to pass over her face. I should start cleaning the crystal for tonight's ceremony. She climbed down the ladder from my lab. I was about to thank her, but it felt disingenuous, and something told me she knew I was only humoring her. I'll call you when it's done, I said, but she didn't answer. Chapter 6 I was relieved to find that the address wasn't a massive tower like some of the city's other projects, but a crumbling four-story row house. Except for an old man pushing a tarp-covered cart down the block, the streets were empty, the coming darkness appearing to have driven everyone indoors. I downed my stealth potion in the cab a few blocks back, and it was already starting to take tingling effect. Cinching my coat, I arrived at the building's front gate to find it ajar. At the building's main doors, I wasn't so lucky. Closed and locked. 
I was armed with dragon sand, but I didn't want to compromise the families inside by destroying the lock. Instead, I eyed the panel of buzzers, family names rendered on plastic labels that had either faded or fallen off. Before I could press a random button, the door shot open and two young men emerged. I stumbled back. They strode past me, joking and shoving one another, not so much as glancing over. My potion was nearing full strength. I recovered in time to slide a foot into the closing doorway and slip inside. In the dingy lobby, caged bulbs blinked overhead. The elevator door was taped over with a giant X, suggesting it was out of order. I took the graffiti-tagged stairwell to the top floor, where I spotted Oliver's unit and a faded red fire alarm on the wall. Opening its cracked plexiglass housing, I took a steadying breath. Let's hope this thing still works, and pulled the tab. For a moment, nothing happened. Then a white light began to strobe, sending out a series of piercing blats. Before long, the door across from Oliver's apartment opened and a woman's head appeared. A second door opened farther down the hall, and another woman peered out. Smell any smoke, Wanda? She asked. Not a whiff. Damn system's acting up again. At least it's not at three in the morning like last time. Yeah, but it might take until three for them to turn it off. I hadn't counted on the residents having suffered enough false alarms to ignore this one. Swearing, I dug out my vial of dragon sand and tossed several granules in front of a nearby utility closet. Backing away, I whispered, Fuoco. The granules erupted into columns of flames. Wanda, who'd begun to close her door, stopped and stared. Fire! she screamed. Her neighbor's head reappeared, the sudden manifestation of flames sending her eyes wide too. The two women ducked back inside long enough to summon their families, who emerged in a multi-generational stampede toward the staircase. Wanda went door to door, slapping them with her palm. A for real fire, she shouted. A for real fire! Oliver's mother led her son out of Unit 402B by the wrist. As the door closed behind them, I summoned a sheet of hardened air between the latch assembly and door frame to keep it from locking. As they hurried past, Oliver, who was still wearing his cape from that afternoon, turned toward me. I was pressed to the wall and still concealed by the stealth potion, but for a moment I could have sworn his gaze found mine through the smoke. He then disappeared into the stairwell behind his mother. Protezione, I called, covering the flames with a dome of hardened air. Deprived of oxygen, the spreading flames dwindled until they were dispersions of smoke. With the floor cleared, I darted into 402B and closed the door behind me. The unit was small, plain, and neat. I could see Janelle's efforts to cover the worst of the cracks in the walls with framed pictures and carpet stains with cheap furniture accents. The warm smells from the kitchen suggested I'd caught her preparing dinner. Drawing my cane into sword and staff, I made my way into Oliver's room, the one with the Garfield bedspread, and looked around. His room was simple, like the rest of the unit, with a small desk and shelves for his books and toys. Beside the head of his bed was a closed closet door. Home of the Babaroga? Remaining back a safe distance, I slid the door open with a force invocation. Small shirts and pants hung from hangers while shoes lined the floor. There was barely enough space for his clothes, much less a resident monster, but I knew better. The room dimmed as I switched to my wizard's senses, and astral energies pulsed into view. Their colors spanned the spectrum, but like Oliver's aura, they were worn and faded, as though the Babaroga had leached the life from them too. On the left side of the closet I honed in on a beating knot of gray energy. With each pulse, frazzled tendrils expanded and contracted, I'd never felt a Babaroga's essence before, but I knew I'd just found it. The source was inside a plastic toy bin. I approached cautiously until I was standing over it. As the last vestiges of the astral realm faded from my vision, I expected to find myself looking down at an old artifact, but it was a brass-colored button, like the kind you'd pin to a shirt. I removed it from the bin and turned it around. It depicted an etched face, but not a Babaroga's. It was Garfield the cat. What in the... I brought the button to my nose and sniffed. The metal was tarnished, but it smelled of copper, a prime storage medium for energy. But how had it come to contain a Babaroga's essence? 
I would figure that out back at my place. I was digging for my salt bag when pounding shook the apartment door. Fire department, a man shouted. Is anyone inside? Are you freaking kidding me? As the blatting alarm cut off, I recalled my disregard for Kayla's concern about them showing up and immediately felt like an ass. The firefighter moved off and began pounding the next door down. All right, I thought at the copper button. Let's get you into the salt and... Ow! Something pierced my palm and I dropped the button. In the web of my hand, blood welled from what looked like a jagged row of teeth marks. On the floor, thick shadows spread from the fallen button like ink. When they began to morph into a shape, I half expected a chunky cat, but it was a woman. A stooped, rag-covered woman with points of eye shine glinting from tangled hair. The Babaroga. As I fumbled to reclaim my sword from my staff hand, the salt from my bag spilled all over the floor. The apparition cackled madly and lunged toward me. Chapter 7 With a grunt, I swung my staff at the incoming apparition. Respingere! Light gathered around the opal inset in the wood and detonated as a flash of force. Furniture toppled and framed pictures crashed from the walls, but the haphazard force also caught the Babaroga's apparition. As her shadowy form spun away, I set my feet and pulled my thoughts together. She's a specter, meaning susceptible to salt. All of the salt that had been in my bag was now scattered across the floor, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I just needed to trap her in a column of hardened air and then whip up the spilled salt to scatter her into history. I had barely completed the thought before she shot toward me again. Damn it. Staggering into a backpedal, I drove my sword forward. The blade disappeared through her gut, but it was like impaling smoke. I tripped over a fallen chair and landed hard on my back. The Babaroga's shadow leered over me, gnarled hands grasping the sides of my head. I heard more than saw her wet mouth open. A smell like spoiled meat in a dumpster hit me full in the face. Disvare, I gagged. Energy surged through my mental prism, shook down the length of my arm, up my sword, and out the apparition. A burst of hot, foul smoke washed over me. I lay there for a moment, talking down the bile, trying to climb my throat while making certain she was really gone. Finally, I stood and peered through the haze. No more Babaroga, not even in my wizard's vision. I spotted the copper button where I dropped it. Garfield's face smirked up at me. Apart from a scum-like residue of gray energy, the button was clean too. I would still need to burn it back at my place. Retrieving the button, I began gathering the spilled salt into a pile when I caught voices outside the door. You sure someone's in there? Yeah, I just heard a bunch of commotion, another voice answered. Whoever's inside, you need to evacuate the building. The fire's out, but you're at risk of smoke inhalation. Great, the firefighters were back. As pounding shook the door, I shoved the pile of salt back into the bag and buried the copper button inside. Break it down, one of them said. I'd been planning to straighten up the place before leaving, but there was no time. I opened the back window, fumbled with a latch for the security bars, and stretched a leg out onto the fire escape. Behind me, the door splintered and slammed open. A pair of firefighters lunged through the lingering smoke. Hey, one of them shouted. Who are you? The other one called. What are you doing? All of my casting had burned through my stealth potion, and I was in plain view. I pulled the security bars closed behind me, uttered a locking spell, and began scrambling down the metal steps. The firefighters arrived at the window a moment later. They shook the bars, but couldn't get them to open. Stop! One shouted. I heard the other one speaking urgently into a radio. It suddenly occurred to me that fire wouldn't be here without a police escort, which meant I really needed to book it. The rickety escape rattled underfoot and whined against its bolts. At the second floor, the escape ended, its extendable ladder missing. Panting, I downed another stealth potion. Now I just needed a couple minutes for it to take effect. I climbed over the rail, dangled from one arm, and dropped into the littered alleyway below. At the same moment, a police cruiser swung into the alley's far end. Shit. Since becoming a wizard, I'd managed to stay off the NYPD's radar. My mentor warned me to keep it that way. After all, what good is a jailed wizard? He would ask in his Irish brogue. Not that I needed the reminding. 
My very tenuous teaching gig at Midtown College was reason enough. An arrest would give my department chair and adversary, Professor Snodgrass, all the reason he needed to can me. As the cruiser came closer, I searched for refuge. There. I crawled over to where someone had dumped an old recliner. It was angled against the wall, and I crouched inside the growing shadow being cast from the oncoming headlights. The cruiser skidded to a stop a few yards short of my hiding place. Doors opened and slammed shut. Footfalls approached. Oscarare, I whispered. The invocation thickened the shadows around me. Did you see which way he went? An approaching female officer asked. I thought she was asking her partner, which would have indicated they'd spotted me, but a firefighter responded through her radio. I lost sight of him when he dropped a few seconds ago. Couldn't have gone far. Flashlight beams appeared. One sliced past me and panned the back of the building beneath the fire escape. The freshly downed stealth potion tingled inside me but had yet to spread through my system. Come on, damn it, I thought at the potion, willing it to take faster effect. A flashlight beam haloed my recliner. A moment later, the female officer drew even with me, but she'd swung the beam back out ahead of her. I squinted at her uniformed silhouette, dreading the moment she would pivot toward me. At her back, her partner's radio squawked with police jargon. Shit, it's a 187 a few blocks away, he said, already retreating. We've got to take it. She hesitated, panning the remaining length of alleyway. Come on, Vega, he called. A white flare blinded me. The beam had hit my face. I awaited the inevitable command to show my hands, but it never came. The officer hadn't been tracking the beam, apparently, because her footsteps fell in behind her partners. Only when the doors slammed shut and the police cruiser reversed did I release my breath. My knees jittered as I straightened. With the stealth potion finally taking effect, I watched until the cruiser disappeared. Almost had me there, I thought at the mystery officer. Almost. Chapter 8 If you're trying to creep me out, you're succeeding. Hmm? I stirred in my reading chair. Off to my right, Tabitha's green eyes glowed from her divan. You've been staring at nothing for the past hour. Had it really been an hour? I checked my watch. Just thinking, well... I'm only now achieving something resembling comfort, and you're threatening everything I've worked for. Wouldn't want that, I muttered, stretching my arms overhead. After the close call at the housing project, I'd made my way to the nearest subway. Back home, I wasted no time liquefying the copper and expunging the last of the Babaroga's residue. But had I really expunged her? From a Garfield button? That easily? Those were the questions I'd been mulling for the last hour. I stood and began working the stiffness from my legs. What's that vile smell? Tabitha demanded, wrinkling her nose. I sniffed my shirt collar. Oh, when I dispersed the Babaroga, her smoke got all over me. That horrid woman in the boy's picture? Good riddance. Not that the boy was much better. I can't believe you allowed those little nitwits to manhandle me, as if I were a common plaything. Sometimes I wonder if death by decapitation wouldn't have been a more dignified existence to this one. Starvation works, too, I suggested. The phone on the kitchen counter rang, interrupting our verbal sparring. Hello, I answered. How did everything go? Kayla asked. Given the neighborhood, about as well as could be expected? I proceeded to tell her what had happened, leaving out the firefighter and police parts. Some juvenile part of me didn't want to admit I'd been wrong. I dispersed the Babaroga's energy and melted the button, I finished. But I'm still puzzling over how the energy came to inhabit the button in the first place. Could it have transferred there from a more potent source? It was a good question and something I'd been considering. Possibly, but it's not in Oliver's apartment. Which means he's safe now? I'd like to think so, but something's still bugging me. Your intuition, she said knowingly. It does that to me, too. She hadn't brought up her crystal ceremony yet. Before she could, I came to a decision. Remember how I told you that once the Babaroga's energy was banished, Oliver would begin recovering? I think that's going to be our best metric for how tonight went, seeing how he looks tomorrow. I'm on the volunteer schedule. I'll do an astral reading. 
Ah, maybe I should be there too. If his energy isn't rebounding, I want to look at his other drawings. Could be a clue in there. We'll need your cat for that. Will she be game? Throughout the conversation, I'd been watching Tabitha in my peripheral vision. After two years, I'd come to learn her various looks and postures well enough to recognize her veiled show of interest. As much as she complained about the kids, she'd savored the attention, especially Oliver's. I just couldn't let Tabitha know that I knew. I don't think that's going to be a problem, I replied. Hey, I'm sorry for earlier. Huh? My reaction when you asked about Clark? I'd almost forgotten the frosty state in which she'd left my apartment. No worries, my fault for prying. He didn't take me seriously. That's why we broke up. Oh, I'm sorry. I know I'm different, and I know I say odd things, and I know you don't always agree with me, but at least you listen. A wave of guilt hit me for the times I'd written her off, if not to her face, then in my mind. Well, you were right about your dad, I said, and Oliver, and I'm a better wizard for having listened. My dad's alive because you listened. The appreciation in her voice bordered on intimate. This was getting intense. I cleared my throat. So, uh, I'll meet you at the Superhero Depot tomorrow at four? It's a date. Tabitha went through the motions of being difficult the following afternoon before agreeing to return to the Superhero Depot. That didn't stop her from grumbling the entire way, though. She had to keep up appearances. As we neared the store, I spotted Kayla out front, her upper body thrust toward Clark, whose hands were raised defensively. I picked up my pace. It's because of you, Kayla shouted in his face. I did what I had to, what I'm required to do by law. You screwed up everything she worked for. Whoa, 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 I said as I arrived. What's going on? When Kayla wheeled toward me, tears streaked her thick eyeliner. Oliver's been taken from his mother. What? Why? Ask him she shouted. Clark blinked indignantly as he moved away from her. He'd replaced the shirt-busting look from yesterday with a cape and shiny red boots. When Oliver came in earlier, he had scratches on his neck. I called the police, as I'm required to by law, and he was removed from his mother's custody. Maybe the scratches happened at school, I said. Oliver's mother claimed he inflicted them on himself. He gave me a tired look that said, Come on, we all know what's going on here. Kayla caught the look too and her small hands clenched into fists. Janelle had nothing to do with it, she insisted. I told you something was feeding on him. Well, I can't run a non-profit on your mystical visions, he said, making woo-woo motions with his fingers. She might be right, I said. Clark snorted. What do you mean, she might be right? Turning away from them, I lifted Tabitha's carrier to my face. In the drawing Oliver showed you yesterday, I whispered. Where was the closet in relation to the bed? The worry in my voice must have stoked her own concern because in a Tabitha first, she didn't play hard to get with her answer. Across from the foot of his bed, is that a problem? Crap, I spat. What? Kayla pulled me back around to face her. He hasn't been drawing the bedroom at his mother's place. That closet is beside the head of his bed. How would you know that? Clark demanded. I ignored his question. In his drawing, the closet is opposite the foot of his bed. Kayla's eyes widened in understanding. We turned to Clark at the same time and asked, Is he with his grandparents? I, I don't know. He stammered at the joint show of force. I assume so. We need the contact info, Kayla said. I don't have it anymore, and if I did, I couldn't just give it to you. Then we need to contact his mother, I said to Kayla. Clark's role in this was done, as far as I was concerned. I tried, Kayla said. She's not answering her phone. Then we need to go to her place. Agreed. Hey, wait a minute, Clark seized my arm. I can't just let you go over there. Move your hand, shiny boots, I growled, or lose it. This is a matter of a boy's life. Lay energy stormed around me, batting my coat and his cape. Uncertainty grew in his blue eyes. 
He felt the energy, too. He looked to Kayla, but she only stared back with the same defiance I felt in my own eyes. Clark released me and backed up against his store. We'll take a cab, I said to Kayla as we started down the street. Finding his voice, Clark shouted after me, Who are you? A real superhero, Kayla shot back. Chapter 9 She must be out, Kayla said after mashing the buzzer for Oliver's unit a fourth time. Do you have any spells for finding him? Not without something belonging to him, I replied. And the only thing I'd had was the copper button, melted now and purged of all residues, including his. I peered up at the four-story housing project, then along the decaying street. It had taken an hour to find a cab willing to drive us into this neighborhood, only to arrive at a dead end. Unless... Will you be all right if I leave Tabitha here for a couple minutes? Where are you going? Kayla asked. Is no one going to consult me? Tabitha pouted. Or am I just chattel? There's a fire escape around back, I said, setting down her pet carrier on a step. I can use it to get into the unit and grab something of Oliver's. A hunting spell will lead us right to him. I didn't say it, but if the original artifact was at his grandparents' place, I doubted Oliver would survive the night. Kayla, who may have been thinking the same, nodded gravely. Only if you're okay with that. Well, don't expect me to carry on a conversation while he's gone, Tabitha interjected. I'll be quick, I assured Kayla. The back alley was less sinister in the light of day. More importantly, it was devoid of people because I hadn't prepared more stealth potion. No time. I dragged the recliner that had concealed me the night before under the fire escape and climbed onto the armrests, but I was still well shy of the platform. Aiming my cane at the ground, I uttered, Vigore. The force blast sent me into the underside of the platform. It was a wonder I didn't break my neck, and even more of one that I managed to grasp a rusty rail. Swearing, I pulled myself over and scampered up the steps, basically last night's escape in reverse. At the window, I unlatched the security gate with another invocation and drew the window open. I listened a moment before stepping in. The apartment had been straightened since my tussle last night with the Babaroga. I thought of Oliver's mother, someone who had overcome significant odds to create a stable, caring environment for her son, only to have him taken from her again. I forced down the sentiment, needing to focus on the task at hand. I was almost to Oliver's room when the floor creaked behind me. Freeze, a woman ordered. I wheeled to find Oliver's mother standing in her bedroom door, glaring at me over twin shotgun barrels. Wait, let me explain, I stammered. Down on the ground? This isn't what it looks. Blam. The blast slammed into my shield of hardened air, spilling sparks and knocking me back. A second shot followed, this time blowing sparks across my face. As the shield wobbled, I dropped to a knee. When Janelle saw I wasn't hurt, she angled her head above her smoking weapon. Are you some kind of demon? No, no, I rasped, showing a hand. Just someone who wants to help. You're the guy who was at the tutoring center yesterday, the one with the cat. I'm a friend of Kayla's, I said hurriedly, remembering the pleasantness she'd shown her. She's the one who's been buzzing you. It's about your son. When Janelle fell silent, she appeared to be deciding whether to believe me or unload another blast. I winced in anticipation of the latter, but she sidestepped to the front door and pressed a button on the intercom. Kayla? she asked. You out there? When no response came, her eyes narrowed at me. I'm here, a breathless voice crackled through the speaker. It's Kayla. Thank God, I sighed. What the hell's going on? Janelle asked her. And who's this fool in my living room? Don't hurt him, he's a friend. We know you didn't harm Oliver. Can we sit down and talk? Janelle hesitated, then pushed the button to let Kayla in the building. I want to phrase this in the most respectful way possible, Kayla said. I'm worried your weapon is impeding the potential for positive communication. We were seated in the living room. Kayla and I crammed together on a cheap love seat. Tabitha's carrier wedged beside me. Oliver's mother faced us from a rattan chair, the shotgun perched across her knees. 
When she replied to Kayla, it was in a voice that was dangerously calm. I haven't had a very good day, honey, and the place where you work had a lot to do with that. Finding your friend creeping toward my little boy's room in a trench coat hasn't improved things, so excuse me for not caring about your feelings toward my weapon. In fact, you have about two minutes to start making sense. Kayla nodded for me to begin, to which I raised my eyebrows. Are you sure? When in doubt, let the truth flow from your lips, she counseled as if quoting a New Age maxim. Like wind whispering wisdom through the ages. Kill me now, Tabitha muttered from the carrier. I blew out my breath. I would be confessing to arson, theft, and two counts of breaking and entering, but Janelle was our only lead to her son and the clock was ticking. I studied my clasped hands and began. Yesterday, Kayla asked me to take a look at Oliver. She was concerned about his health. I'm a professor of mythology, but I also dabble in magic. I help people with supernatural afflictions. Sure enough, his aura was depleted in a way it shouldn't have been. Not for someone his age. I couldn't imagine how Janelle was looking at me, and didn't want to. I forged on. He was also drawing pictures of a creature in his closet, a horned hag. There's a name for her, a babaroga, and she was feeding on his life force. Believing her essence was stored in an object, I came here last night, pulled the building's alarm to get you and your son out of the unit, and searched Oliver's room. Janelle grunted knowingly. I destroyed the object, a copper button, but it only held some of the Babaroga's essence. The lion's share is in the original artifact, which I believe is at his grandparents' place. The rest is in Oliver himself, only a little, I hastened to add, recalling the way he'd looked at me last night when he and his mother were evacuating. But enough that the Babaroga could compel him to scratch himself so he'd be sent back to his grandparents and the original artifact. Just now, I was retrieving something of Oliver's from his room, something I could use to find him. I can track energies. It's all true, Kayla put in. We just want to help him, I finished. I promise. When I lifted my head, I expected to find Oliver's mother staring like one would at a drooling patient in an asylum, maybe even aiming her gun again, but she was squinting thoughtfully. That actually explains some things. I blinked in surprise. It does? Not just the way he is, but his fear of closets. Most nights he comes into my room to sleep, and I started having these nightmares that an old woman was trying to drag Ollie away from me. I thought they came from the pictures he was drawing, because they bothered me. But you're saying it was an actual... She broke off and wiped a tear from under her right eye. And then when he scratched himself this morning, he'd never done anything like that before. None of this is your fault, Kayla said gently. Her eyes blazed with anger, but no longer directed at us. This hag is at his grandparents' place? Most likely in an old artifact, I said. Can you think of what it might be? Those are his father's parents, she explained. He died in a shootout, and they've been fighting for custody of Ollie since before he was born. Me and them don't get along real well. I've only been in their place one time. Do you know if they collect antiques? I pressed. Not antiques, but his grandfather combs the beaches on the weekends. Wait a sec. She drew her phone from a pocket. To keep tabs on Ali, I friended his grandpa's page through a fake account. He's always posting his latest findings. She tapped and scrolled for several moments. Yeah, here it is. He's got an album full of that crap. When she extended the phone... I nodded for Kayla to take it. I looked over her shoulder as she scrolled clumsily through the images. Kayla wasn't a smartphone user either, but her aura didn't fry sensitive circuits. The photos were of bottles of different shapes and colors, cans for vintage brands, and artistic-looking lengths of driftwood. But then she scrolled past something dull white and oblong. Wait, go back, I said. Kayla squinted. That's a seashell, isn't it? No. A cold force wrapped my heart. Worse. Janelle came over to see. How is that thing worse? We're no longer looking for an artifact. That's an actual Babaroga's horn. Janelle read off the date stamp. He took that the day before I brought Oliver home. That's when the transfer to your son's button happened, I said. 
Explains how her energy ended up in your apartment here. Kayla's eyes widened. According to your book, a babaroga can emerge from her horn fully formed. Which makes it far more dangerous than a mere artifact, I thought. She intends to consume all of her body and soul. Outside the window, the afternoon light was beginning to slant toward dusk. I needed to locate that horn ASAP and reduce it to powder. But everything depended on Janelle. We don't have much time if we're going to stop her, I told her. She took her shotgun in both hands and pivoted toward the door. Follow me. Chapter 10 The sun had dipped behind the surrounding rooftops by the time the cab dropped us off at Oliver's grandparents, a small house with a neat yard in Queens. We hurried to the front door where Janelle began pounding. Can you do that a little louder? Tabitha complained. At the sound of door bolts being drawn, I switched her carrier to my other hand. The door opened on a chain, and an elderly man with receding hair and a round belly peered out. A smaller woman wedged herself in front of him, her face drawing to a shriveled point around pink frosted lips. You're not supposed to be here, she said to Janelle. I need to see Oliver, she replied in her calm, dangerous voice. He's in trouble. Yeah, from your fingernails. The grandmother snapped. You're not coming near him. Her gaze shifted from Janelle to Kayla and then to me. I attempted my most disarming smile, which only caused her eyes to thin further before dropping to my pet carrier. What she made of our motley crew I had no idea, but like a lioness defending a cub, her focus returned to the perceived threat. You have ten seconds to leave, she told Janelle, and I count fast. Then I'm going to ask you to hand over something that's harming Oliver. Pulling out her smartphone, Janelle held up the photo of the Babaroga's horn. The grandfather leaned in for a closer look. How about that? He said in surprise. The seashell I found at Rockaway Beach. Get back, Clifford, the grandmother grunted, shoving him away. Call the police. Janelle blocked the closing door with her foot, drew her concealed shotgun from behind her leg, and aimed it at the grandmother's face. Bring us the horn, Janelle said from a set jaw. All right, okay, I said, stepping forward. Let's be careful where we point that, huh? The grandmother stood her ground, a smile pinching her lips in a way that said, I win. Indeed, when this got back to the judge, that Janelle threatened her at gunpoint, she would lose her son for good. In another second, Janelle was going to come to the same realization, making her even more dangerous. I was reaching for the barrel when, from inside the house, a child's cry pealed out. The grandmother started. Fear exploded through my gut. Oliver, Janelle shouted. She slammed the stock end of the shotgun into the doorframe. The chain burst, knocking the door open and the grandmother into a backpedal. Janelle raced past her. I followed, steadying the grandmother before chasing Janelle down a corridor, the pet carrier swinging wildly from my grip, Tabitha swearing up a storm. We passed the grandfather who had obediently gone into the kitchen to call the police. Crap. I paused to aim my cane at his phone. Disfare. A cone of raw energy swallowed his device, blowing out the circuitry. He dropped it with a small yelp, but I'd lost ground on Janelle. Kayla, who had entered the house behind me, collided into my back. Keep the grandparents away, I panted. Then to Janelle, wait! She'd entered a room off the end of the corridor. When I arrived moments later, I found little Oliver standing against the wall, a Garfield blanket clutched to his chest, round eyes fixed on the open closet opposite the foot of his bed. We'd gotten the right bedroom this time, only I couldn't see anything. Ollie, baby, what is it? His mother asked. What's wrong? He didn't so much as glance over. I was switching to my wizard's senses when something shifted in the back of the closet. A moment later, it skittered into the light of the room. The object took a moment to make sense of, but it was the Babaroga's horn, crawling on what looked like a set of gnarled crab legs. The horn's pointed end was aimed at Oliver, as if claiming him. Get back, I said to Janelle, who was between me and the horn. But she'd already raised the gun to her shoulder. Cover your ears, baby. Oliver's wrists went to the sides of his head an instant before she squeezed. The deafening blast sent the horn airborne in a burst of powder. But as the horn collided into a wall, 
The legs sprang out, becoming fingers. The rest of the Babaroga emerged behind them, black rags billowing as she landed in the room on gnarled feet. The horn was now seated in her forehead. It parted her dank oil-black hair, revealing a pair of murderous eyes the color of rotten squash. And she was huge, the hump of her bent back nearly touching the ceiling. Oliver released another shrill scream. I dropped Tabitha's carrier, producing an explosion of swearing, but before I could move past Janelle, she fired again. The Babaroga took the shot in the chest, black smoke breaking past her face, but she barely flinched. A bone-thin arm slashed across the room. Janelle cried out as nails raked her and knocked the gun from her grip. She clutched her right forearm to her chest and lunged between the creature and her son. Back off, she screamed at the monstrosity, blood spilling between her fingers. The Babaroga was no doddering hag. She was large and lightning fast, with enormous hands for snatching and a mouth that stretched from ear to ear for devouring. The horrible gargle in her throat sounded like a cross between laughter and retching. Her other arm lashed out, but I shouted an invocation first. Vigore! The force that erupted from my cane shot past Janelle, scattering her braids and caught the Babaroga in the face. Her head snapped and she staggered backward, fingernails grooving the walls. Cover Oliver, I said to Janelle. She'd ignored my directives thus far, but that one seemed to get through. She took her son to the floor and used her body to shield him. With nothing standing between the Babaroga and me now, I separated my cane into sword and staff, an acid bite of fear in my throat. The creature had caught herself in front of the closet, her obscenely large hands gripping the sides of the opening. She yanked, propelling herself back toward me. I thrust my staff and shouted, Protezione! Light crackled from the opal end and hardened into a blunt barrier that caught the arriving Babaroga in the gut. I swung my sword at her horn. The blade scraped off it at a bad angle, leaving it intact. Need to trap her for a cleaner cut. Staff raised, I spoke into the air between us. Light glistened along hard, transparent edges. When the Babaroga rushed in again, I slammed the walls of air around her, leaving an opening for her horn. I raised my blade to pry it loose. She responded by thrashing and shaking. The motion emitted a disorganizing energy, rippling my manifestation. I pushed more power into the trap, but it only made her more frenetic. And now, nightmare visions of bloody caves and children's cries were jagging through my head. What in the ever-loving hell is going on in here? I looked over to find the grandmother arriving in the doorway. She stopped suddenly, the color falling from her face as her gaze moved from me to the thrashing monstrosity. I tried to keep her away, Kayla said, appearing behind her. But she's a lot stronger than she looks. The grandfather poked his head over her shoulder and took in the scene. My shell, he exclaimed, pointing at the horn set in the Babaroga's forehead, as if IDing a stolen item. Meanwhile, Kayla was fishing in her bag for something. She pulled out a large reddish-brown mineral, her prized carnelian crystal. What pointless plan she had in mind for it, I couldn't begin to guess. Still struggling to contain the Babaroga, I shouted, Get them out of here! Kayla returned the crystal to her bag and corralled the grandparents into the room opposite us, at the same moment, my enclosure around the Babaroga failed. Her lashing nails scraped off my raised blade, forcing it aside. The knotted knuckles of her backhand caught me in the side. Pain shot through my ribs, and I landed against a wall. Potions and spell implements spilled from my pockets as I crashed to the floor. Shallow nether creatures are so much easier, I thought of my normal work. By the time I winced myself upright, the Babaroga was facing Oliver. Though Janelle was still covering him, one of his socked feet was poking out from under her stomach. The creature spotted it too. Gleeful-sounding gibberish poured from her mouth. Still dazed, I attempted a protection, but the gathered energy scattered like smoke. The Babaroga grabbed Oliver's foot, then screamed and retracted her hand. Tabitha had bitten her. My cat stalked forward, a low caterwaul in her throat. The Babaroga took an uncertain step back, as much from the menacing ginger tabby as from the blood-red energy growing around her. Wispy tendrils stretched forward, caressing the creature. I didn't know if a Babaroga could be seduced, but this was clearly her first exposure to a succubus's power, and it was confusing the hell out of her. 
It also bought me time. I looked around at the various tubes and bags that had spilled from my coat pockets. They would either be ineffective against a creature of her strength or too dangerous to deploy in a confined space. A confined space? Kayla, I called. She appeared from the room across the hall, stuffing the grandparents back inside before closing the door again. The carnelian crystal, I shouted. Nodding quickly, she pulled it from her bag and underhanded it to me. I caught it and wheeled toward the Babaroga, who was shaking off her confusion. A gnarled foot struck out from under her rags and caught my cat in the gut. She went yowling through the air, landing somewhere behind the bed. The Babaroga waved away the lingering red mist and reoriented herself to Oliver. Just need to get this thing inside her, I thought, palming the crystal. Too fast, the Babaroga's arms shot out, seizing Oliver's entire leg. He screamed. Janelle began beating her arm. Unfazed, the creature dragged Oliver out from under her, pulling him toward her yawning mouth. Ali, Janelle cried, grasping for his hands before losing them. I lunged forward and crammed the crystal into the back of the Babaroga's mouth. She gargled violently and dropped Oliver. Nerve endings screamed through my upper arm as she clamped her teeth. I winced as much from the pain as the horrid smell coming out of her, but I kept pushing, kept forcing it down. When the crystal was well inside her throat, I gathered my power and shouted, Disfare! The invocation that surged through my mental prism and down my arm became trapped inside the crystal. There it vibrated, the energy multiplying inside the carnelian's sheer faces, gaining strength. The Babaroga's mouth clamped down harder. I gritted my teeth as jagged teeth punched through muscle and ground against bone. Much more, and I'd lose the arm at the shoulder. Amoeba-like spots swarmed my vision. At last, the energy overcame the crystal's resistance. In a violent flash, the Babaroga blew apart. Rotten pieces of her body slapped the walls before crumbling into piles of ash over the floor. All except for her horn, which remained suspended before dropping like a weight. I grabbed it out of the air, emptied a pile of salt from my pocket onto the carpet, added dragon sand, and dropped the horn on top. Shaping a cylinder of hardened air around everything, I uttered, Fuoco. A bright column of flames burst from the sand, singeing the ceiling, but it dropped down again, engulfing the horn. From inside, a faint shriek sounded, but that too dampened and then died out altogether. By the time the flames were exhausted, the horn looked like a black chunk of cinder. Dispersing the cylinder, I stepped forward, but Janelle beat me to the final deed. With a decisive stomp, she brought her boot heel down onto the horn and ground it apart. Mama! We both turned to find Oliver sitting up, his arms stretched toward her. I'm here, baby, she said, picking him up and hugging him against her. I'm right here. He hugged her back with both arms and legs. Mama, he repeated, but with conviction this time. His first word spoken in months, and it was a good one, confirmed by Janelle's snuffling laugh. I looked around for Tabitha and found her pawing one of the piles of the Babaroga's ashes, as if she'd just relieved herself in it. In fact, I was sure she had. On the floor nearby was the carnelian crystal. I picked it up and carried it to Kayla, who was taking in the incredible scene from the doorway. Is it all over? she asked. Though bruised, battered, and bleeding down my arm, I managed to smile. It's over. Chapter 11 One Week Later I don't see her anywhere, Tabitha complained from inside her carrier. And I'm getting a chill. We were on the sidewalk in front of the superhero depot, and Kayla was late, but the weather couldn't have been more perfect. The cold front that had pushed off the November heat wave scattered fall leaves along the street and buffeted my trench coat. At least one of us was enjoying it. Remember last week when you said you were so hot you would never complain about the cold again? I reminded her. With my luck, I'm coming down with something terminal, she pouted. I rolled my eyes, knowing what she was really after. If you want to go in, just say it. And be besieged by those little cretins? I'd rather take my chances with pneumonia. Recognizing her resistance as token, I carried her inside. 
I avoided Clark, who was helping someone at the register, and headed for the back, where I opened the bookcase onto the secret passageway. It was Friday afternoon and the tutoring center was full. Kayla had wanted us to meet her here for a surprise, which I thought was going to be Oliver's return, but he wasn't here. Even Tabitha couldn't hide the weight of disappointment in her eyes. I imagined the boy was entangled in legal doings over his custody and would be for some time. Troy, a.k.a. Fade Cut, twisted around in his seat. Hey, is that dude Everson and his cat? And she's even fatter than the last time. He led the charge toward us. I lifted the carrier over their heads as the kids pressed around and jumped for her. Tabitha peered down from her perch, clearly lording over the attention. I even caught a small grin. Garfield, someone called. The kids quieted and turned. I almost didn't recognize the little boy coming toward us. Neither did anyone else, it seemed. His chestnut eyes beamed above his broad, boyish smile. The volunteers broke up the kids and ushered them back to their seats, all except for Oliver. I'd told Kayla that children's auras were resilient, but holy hell, his entire being was brimming with light. Hey, buddy, I said, feeling as though I were witnessing a miracle. How are you doing? Great, he replied brightly, but he only had eyes for Tabitha, whom I lowered again. Look what I'm wearing he said, twirling so that the big G on his cape swelled in and out of her view. Then to me, Can I? I looked at Tabitha, who gave a tired shrug as if she would tolerate him. Oliver's mother, who had entered the tutoring center behind him, said, Fine with me. Just take her to the back, away from the other kids, I whispered to Oliver. Troy, especially. He accepted the carrier in his eager hands and hurried off talking a mile a minute through the mesh door. I shook my head. Unbelievable. Right? Janelle came up beside me. Every day's been better than the last. It's like he's making up for lost time. Any lingering effects? She shook her head. He sleeps through the night and wakes up smiling, stoked for the new day. How about you? She held up the arm that the Babaroga had gashed. Whatever you did fixed it right up, she said referring to my healing spell. It was the same spell I'd applied to my own shoulder, the soreness only now leaving the tissue. And the custody situation? I asked carefully. His grandparents dropped the case. We worked out something with a mediator that's going to be good for everyone. Oliver, most of all. She extended her hand toward me. Thanks for everything. I accepted her firm shake. Just glad I could help. We turned to watch Oliver. He'd opened the carrier door and was trying to coax Tabitha out. So, not allergic to cats? I joked. Janelle laughed. Nah, Oliver loves them. I just wanted to set some ground rules with you. But now that we're buds, you're welcome to come over with your cat whenever you want. Just use the front door next time. Now it was my turn to laugh. She looked around. Kayla said she'd be here, but I've got an appointment to get to. Can you tell her I'll be back to pick him up? Oh, and she pulled a piece of paper from her purse. Oliver drew this last night. I want you to have it. It was a picture of a large ginger cat with luminous green eyes. It's beautiful, I said. Since that night, it's all he's been drawing. As she left, she passed Clark, who had entered the tutoring center at some point. He opened his mouth, but when she ignored him, he closed it again. I strolled over. Everson, he said formally. I'm not going to add insult to injury. I know you thought you were doing your job, but Kayla was right about Oliver. I can't explain how, but she knows things. Listen to her next time. He nodded as if he would take it under advisement and hurried off to talk to one of the volunteers. Psst, someone whispered. From the secret corridor, Kayla's pixie hair glowed moon white. She hooked a finger for me to join her. I looked over at Oliver, who was giggling and hugging Tabitha. My cat stared at me with a flat-eared frown that suggested she was reaching her capacity for attention. Another few minutes wouldn't kill her. Sorry I'm late, Kayla whispered as I joined her in the shadows of the narrow corridor. I wanted you to see him for yourself. It's amazing, but what are we doing in here? I overheard what you said to Clark. Her eyes beamed up at me. I appreciate that, 
But for you, that little boy wouldn't be here. It helps knowing a wizard. We make a good team. We do, don't we? I was suddenly aware of how close we were, as if by some gravitational force our faces were drawing together, a scent of sage and sandalwood filling my breathing. An inch apart, she touched her forehead to mine. It wouldn't last, she whispered. I've read your future, and it's with a woman who isn't me. Someone you've already met. As if coming out of a spell, I straightened and coughed into a fist. My wisdom's suggesting I not complicate our friendship, she said, touching her hair. Though still dizzy with our near kiss, I nodded in agreement. What I told Clark, I said, if I'm being honest, it was as much for me as for him. I've doubted you too, and I'm sorry about that. She seized my lapels and yanked me in. Her kiss was as close to my mouth as one could get while still technically being on my cheek. I was tempted to correct that but her wisdom was right. My relationships since becoming a wizard rarely ended well, and I decided I wanted Kayla to remain a part of my life. As we separated, she smiled shyly and smoothed my lapels. How about a couple magic tricks for the kids? She said. Chapter 12 I sank into my reading chair that evening, cracked a beer, and took a long swallow. My little celebration for our happy ending on the Babaroga case. I looked from Oliver's drawing of Tabitha, which I'd taped above her divan, to the model herself, dozing comfortably. When she caught me watching, she squinted irritably. Can I get you anything? I asked. We're not talking, she reminded me. Oh, come on. Suspending you in midair and having you somersault was a great trick. Didn't you see the kids' faces? They loved it. How could I see their faces when everything was spinning violently? They're lucky I didn't projectile vomit all over them. Admit it. You enjoy their attention. I'm over it. I laughed triumphantly. I knew it. You have a soft spot for kids. If ever I did, you succeeded in ruining it, like you do everything. I'll never subject myself to that kind of mockery again. In fact, I'll be content to never see those doughy-faced fiends for as long as I exist. Even Oliver? Why do you insist on tormenting me? I smiled at her deflection, which meant no, and took another sip. Tabitha's frown morphed into a roguish grin. So... What were you and Miss Featherpants doing in that secret passage all pressed up against one another? Talking. I have night vision, darling. Fine, we had a moment, but it passed. We decided our friendship was more important. Thank God, I can only imagine the offspring the two of you would produce. Dippy little imps who dye their hair ridiculous colors and run around annoying everyone. I'd have no choice but to end myself. I replayed Kayla's and my almost kiss before considering her remarks about the woman I would end up with. Someone you've already met. I thought of Johanna, the young woman I'd saved from Tabitha when she was a full-blown succubus, but our relationship had faded with distance. And then there was Caroline Reed, a fellow professor at Midtown College, but my admiration for her was a one-way street. It was a pointless exercise, I decided. New York was a big city, and I'd met a lot of women in my various doings. It could be any of them. Plus, I already had my hands full with the most demanding one of all. Be a darling and rub my shoulders, she murmured. Your wretched magic trick knotted me up all over. I sighed and set my beer aside. Sure, Tabby. Thanks for listening to Back Off, Witch, the second in the Croft and Tabby series. If you enjoyed this story, please like and comment to let us know. And don't forget to subscribe for more audiobooks set in the Croftverse. For Everson Croft's backstory and to learn how he and Tabitha met, be sure to check out the Prof Croft prequels, also available on this channel. When you're ready for the main series, the 32-hour Prof Croft box set is now on Audible. Back Off, Witch. A Croft and Tabby short was written by Brad Magnarella. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin. 
Post-production by Mike Straza. Production coordination by Candace Lawrence and produced by Blue Nose Audio. Copyright 2022 by Brad Magnarella. Production copyright 2022 by Brad Magnarella.